Hello everyone, this is Mr. Lawback. I hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining me. In this video, we are going to review the tension between the North and the South prior to the Civil War, take a look at the Free Soil Movement, the Underground Railroad, and important literature regarding slavery. Now, some of the items in this video will be a little bit of review, but it will help with context. So let's start with the conflict between the North and the South. Historians have identified at least four main causes of the conflict between the North and the South. Number one, and the most important, is slavery. As a growing moral issue in the North versus its defense and expansion in the South. Remember, four million Americans were enslaved. Constitutional disputes over the nature of the federal union and states' rights. Economic differences between the industrializing North and the agricultural South over such issues as tariffs, the National Bank, and internal improvements. Political blunders and extremism on both sides, which some historians conclude resulted in an unnecessary war. So within Congress, there was a lot of political extremism and very little compromise. Some compromise might have helped to avoid the Civil War altogether. So conflict over the status of new territories. The issue of slavery in the territories gained in the Mexican War became the focus of sectional differences in the late 1840s. The Wilmot Proviso, which excluded slavery from the new territories, would have upset the Compromise of 1820 and the delicate balance between 15 free states and 15 slave states. David Wilmot was the sponsor of the Wilmot Proviso, and he was from Pennsylvania, and he was a free soiler. The Wilmot Proviso passed the House several times, but was defeated in the Senate and never actually became official policy. Its defeat only intensified regional differences. So the Free Soil Movement. Northern Democrats and Whigs supported the Wilmot Proviso and the position that all blacks, slave and free, should be excluded from the Mexican session. In the North, anti-slavery forces and racists alike could find common ground in their support for the free soil position. Unlike the abolitionists, who insisted on eliminating slavery everywhere, the free soilers did not demand the end of slavery where it had already existed. Instead, they sought to keep the West a land of opportunity for whites only, so that the white majority would not have to compete with the labor of slaves or free blacks. In the 1840s and 50s, Abraham Lincoln was a free soiler as well, and he would later, of course, become an abolitionist. In 1848, Northerners favoring this approach to the territories organized the Free Soil Party, which adopted the slogan, Free Soil, Free Labor, and Free Men. In addition to its chief objective, preventing the extension of slavery, the new party also advocated free homesteads, or public land grants to small farmers, and internal improvements. The Free Soil Movement was most impactful between 1848 and 1854, and then was eventually absorbed by the Republican Party. Now the Southern position. Most Southern whites viewed any attempt to restrict the expansion of slavery as a violation of their constitutional right to take and use their property as they wished. They saw both the abolitionists and free soilers as intent on the ultimate destruction of slavery and the Southern way of life. More moderate Southerners favored extending the Missouri Compromise Line of 3630 westward to the Pacific Ocean and permitting territories north of that line to be non-slave territories or free territories. Now the Underground Railroad. The term Underground Railroad was coined in 1831 although a similar network had started much earlier after the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 and as northern states started to become free states and outlaw slavery. In the late 1700s, Quakers had been operating a very similar network of getting slaves to freedom. So a couple things about the Underground Railroad. It was not a railroad, of course, and of course it was not underground either. It was very dangerous for the participants in the Underground Railroad, either those on the run or those helping those escape to freedom. The Underground Railroad, the fabled network of conductors, 
stations, depots, and safe houses helped escaped slaves reach freedom in the northern U.S. and in Canada, where slavery was completely abolished. It was not organized or dominated by white abolitionists, as is sometimes believed. Both northern free blacks and courageous ex-slaves led other blacks to freedom. The escaped slave Harriet Tubman made at least 19 trips into the South to help some 300 slaves escape. Free blacks in the North and abolitionists also organized vigilance committees to protect fugitive slaves from slave catchers. Once the Civil War broke out, black leaders such as Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth continued to take an active role in the emancipation of slaves and supported black soldiers in the Union cause. The Underground Railroad ended in 1863 in the midst of the Civil War and was later not necessary as the abolition of slavery occurred due to the 13th Amendment. So here is a map of some of the typical routes of the Underground Railroad. Now this was a very secretive network, of course, but as you can see right in the area that we live, in the Philadelphia area was a common route of the Underground Railroad. Now these blue states were free states, the gray states were slave states, and as you can see, when you were further south, sometimes the quickest route to freedom would be to Mexico or leaving the United States into the Caribbean. You can also see that ports in Savannah and Charleston would secretly ship escaped slaves into the north. And for many escaped slaves, the safest place to go was into Canada. Now, there were other escape networks other than this, but these were just some of the main routes that were taken. Literature on slavery. Popular books, as well as unpopular laws, stirred the emotions of people of all regions. Uncle Tom's Cabin. The most influential book of its day was a novel about the conflict between a slave named Tom and the brutal white slave owner, Simon Legree. The publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852 by the northern writer Harriet Beecher Stowe moved a generation of northerners, as well as many Europeans, to regard all slave owners as monstrous and cruel and inhumane. Uncle Tom's Cabin gave many northerners their first exposure to the horrors of slavery. Many of them simply weren't aware of how cruel slavery was. Uncle Tom's Cabin also strengthened the abolition movement and increased the calls for the end of slavery due to moral reasons. By 1857, two million copies of Uncle Tom's Cabin were sold worldwide. In the first year of publication, 300,000 were sold in the United States alone. Southerners condemned the untruths in the novel and looked upon it as one more proof of the Norse incurable prejudice against the Southern way of life. Later, when President Lincoln met Mrs. Stowe, he is reported to have said, so you're the little lady who wrote the book that made this great war, in reference to the Civil War, of course. Now, more literature. The impending crisis of the South. Although it did not appear until 1857, Hinton R. Helper's book of nonfiction, Impending Crisis of the South, attacks slavery from another angle. The author, a native of North Carolina, used statistics to demonstrate to fellow Southerners that slavery had a negative impact on the South's economy. Southern states acted quickly to ban the book, but it was widely distributed in the North by anti-slavery and free soil leaders. Responding to the Northern literature that condemned slavery as a terrible evil, pro-slavery whites in the South counterattacked by arguing that slavery was just the opposite, a positive good for slave and master alike. They argued that slavery was sanctioned by the Bible and was firmly grounded in philosophy and history. Southern authors contrasted the conditions of northern wage workers, which they referred to as wage slaves, forced to work long hours in factories and mines, with the family-like bonds that often developed on plantations between slaves and masters. George Fitzhugh, the boldest and best known of the pro-slavery authors, tacked the capitalist wage system as worse than slavery. Among his works were Sociology of the South, published in 1854, and Cannibals All, pictured to the right, published in 1857. Big Takeaways, Effects of Laws and Literature 
The effect of the Fugitive Slave Law and the anti-slavery and pro-slavery literature was polarizing throughout the nation and added to the divide between the North and the South. Northerners who had earlier scorned the abolitionist cause now became concerned about the moral issues posed by slavery. At the same time, a growing number of Southerners became convinced that the North's goal was to destroy the institution of slavery and the way of life based upon it in the South. So I hope this information helps you better understand the free soil movement, the continuing conflict between the North and the South in the mid-1800s, and the impact that literature had on the abolition movement.